So one of the most visible trends that we are seeing right now is the growth of UPI transactions. Whether it is in ordering food, paying for your cigarettes outside, or even snacks, or even making larger payments, UPI is emerging as the medium of choice. Now, this is as far as digital infrastructure goes. Looking at capital infrastructure, we're also seeing things like highway construction, airport construction, and rail connectivity also growing at a fast pace. And then we have taxation infrastructure such as GST, which has made it far easier to do business across state borders. Now, all of this is resulting in two major trends. One is the increased earning power of small businesses at the bottom of the pyramid. And the other is the concentration of profits in the hand of a handful of in the hands of a handful of companies at the top of the pyramid. This is what we're going to talk about in this episode of Quartermaster. I'm TCA Sharad Raghavan, Economy Editor at The Print, and we have with us investment guru Saurabh Mukherjee, who has kindly agreed to share his wisdom with, wisdom with us once again. And we also have his colleague at Marcellus Investment Managers, Nandita, who herself is a powerhouse of research and analysis. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. So we start at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, now, UPI transactions have changed the way that we interact with the small vendors outside. And, you know, could you tell us a little more how it's changed the game? Because the pandemic, of course, helped us in, you know, doing contactless payments and all of that. But even since the pandemic, there's been a huge growth in UPI. So could you just tell us how it's changed the game? Absolutely. So, uh, Sharath, what we're seeing uh, incrementally, and this has been, as you rightly pointed out, especially after the pandemic, that there's a rise of a new digital India, which is more scalable, which is more efficient, and which is, you know, preferring to do all its tra transactions online. So, uh, to give you an example, to set the context here, uh, just right outside our office in Andheri in Mumbai, there is this one tiny uh, Chai vendor that you know everyone uh, in and around our office goes to for their uh, you know uh, afternoon chai, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and basically everyone over there, most of them that I see uh, over there, pay with UPI. They do not take out cash even for something as uh, small an amount as twenty rupees. So this is the incremental change that we're seeing. Then I also had a word with him, and he said that when he had started his. Uh, uh, the entire kiosk, I think a year ago, he was just selling around 500 to 600 cups of tea a day. And most of the payments that he received uh, for those cups of uh, chai were uh, via cash. So that was, and UPI accounted for around 20 to 30 percent. However, today he's selling almost 7,000 to 8,000 cups a day of chai. Wow. And uh, most of the payments, around 70 to 80 percent of the payments are via UPI. So that's uh, a humongous change that we are seeing around, you know, 16x, 17x increase in his sales over just one year, and most of it uh, being paid by UPI. Similarly, there's just a cigarette vendor right outside uh, our office as well, right next to the chai vendor. And uh, he set up his shop around four months ago uh, when he was doing sales worth rupees, you know, around 1,000 per day. Today, just after four months, he's selling uh, goodies worth 8,000 rupees. And he himself said that, you know, whatever payments I make personally also as a vendor to you know, get uh, procure all the materials that I do. I prefer doing it via UPI. He does not hold a credit card or a debit card. He has a bank account and he uses UPI. So this is the change that we're incrementally seeing, that uh, rise of a uh, new and, you know, a more efficient India where UPI is the preferred, uh, you know, via of uh, payment. Right. So Nandita, you mentioned now two things here. One is that his sales themselves have grown. And the proportion of sales that are being done on UPI also have grown. Now, is is one driving the other? Is it that because it's so easy to pay that now people are paying more and buying more? Yes, partly that is also the solution, uh, the, the, the answer to it, because people are, uh, it's become so much easier. So I'll give you a personal example. My father just started using UPI a month ago, I think, when he changed his phone. And uh, there has been no stopping after. I mean, everywhere he goes, right from the petrol pump to the smallest of groceries to, you know, even paying for a bowl of Maggie when he'd gone to Andaman's recently, everything is via UPI. He does not take out his card. He does not take out his cash. And mind you, this was a person who used to rely heavily on credit cards. And now that has just gone inside his wallet. It stayed there. 
and the only thing that he uses is UPI and you know his phone to do all the transactions. No, absolutely. The the especially the QR codes, just scanning the QR code and making that payment has made life so much simpler. And but the thing is that uh, apart from UPI, there's been a growth in total digital transactions as well. It's not just UPI, although that is a big uh, growth driver. There are other aspects of digital transactions that have been growing. So uh, could you tell us a little more about that and how that's changing the economy? So, so let me just take take uh, take that uh, cue, Shash. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so if you look at if you look at the payment data, and Nandita has pulled together some data from both uh, RBI and from SBI, State Bank of India research. Hmm. What the data is suggesting is that if we add up NEFT, uh, IMPS, RTGS, which is the RBI's three right. three uh, pre UPI means of electronic payment. Uh, and add to that credit credit cards and debit cards. Eighty-eight uh, percent of transactions in India now, eighty-eight percent of transactions in India by value are by by digital methods. Right? Out of this, UPI is roughly half of it, which means UPI itself accounts for roughly forty-five percent of India's national income. That means one point seven trillion dollars worth of one point seven trillion dollars worth of uh, of uh, 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 financial value is going through UPI every year. 40, 40, 45 percent of national income, right? That's a remarkable number. There's no other there's no other real time peer to peer payment system in the world doing anything like this sort of uh, 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 insane number. One point seven trillion on a peer to peer system, as Nadita explained, uh, her, her dad is paying for auto rickshaws and we are paying for chai outside. Or these are peer to peer payments. 1.7 trillion is a massive number. Just to give you a sense of how much this has grown, uh, using data from NPCI, what we figured is uh, if we take the latest month ka data, which I think November 22 data, India did 4 billion. In, in, this is a number, this is a count, this is not a value. India did 4 billion by count, 4 billion peer to peer to merchant transactions in, in the month of November. Two years ago, two Novembers ago, that number was 1 billion. So 1 billion has become 4 billion. We have 4x the number of uh, UPI peer to merchant transactions. And, uh, and, and remember, these are two years uh, ca characterized by COVID, uh, characterized by other sorts of strife. And yet, uh, one of the most innovative means of payment anywhere in the world has caught on like wildfire. And this materially improves the lives of small businesses. So the, the chai vendor and the cigarette vendor, Nandita referenced, uh, they're getting paid quicker. Uh, they're getting paid uh, uh, in a, by a means which they can use immediately to pay their suppliers. They don't have to spend time taking 50 rupees from Nandita, giving her 25 back for time wasted. Nahi ho uh, plus, they don't have to waste time going to the bank. The money gets banked automatically. The most important long-term benefit, Nandan Nilekani had the prescience to tell me this eight years ago. Believe it or not, Nandan told me this eight years ago. Nandan said eight years ago that what will happen is once these sorts of vendors, once the banks can see uh, this uh, chai vendor outside our office, for example, is banking with Kotak Bank. Kotak Bank will be able to see that this guy is doing 8,000 credits. He's getting 8,000 credits, 25 rupees per credit times 8,000 a day, Kotak Bank naturally will want to provide this chai vendor working capital finance. And therefore, unsecured working capital fund finance, uh, a, a working capital finance for SMEs on a, a basis there, UPI flow will become one of the biggest opportunities for the banks and become a source of low cost funding for millions of chota businesses. Uh, all credit to Nandan for having the prescience to uh, uh, visualize this eight, nine years ago, and now it's becoming a reality and you know, all of us are the beneficiaries of that. Right. And uh, now this is some uh, a funny thing that I saw on uh, our favorite WhatsApp university, which is that basically because of the growth of UPI transactions, the toffee industry has taken a hit because earlier when they had to give uh, change, they used uh -huh. to give they used to give toffees. Uh, yeah. And now there's they, they can you're, you're paying an exact change to the toffee Lovely. industry. I don't think that that's true, but the fact is that you're getting exact change. There's none of the hassle of not getting chutta and all of that. So UPI is very, very convenient. And that's a game changer. It's a game changer. Yeah. And uh, so that's at the bottom of the pyramid. Coming to the top of the pyramid, now, as your research uh, points out, wealth creation seems to be concentrated in the hands of just about a dozen and a half companies. Uh, this was true in the decade before 2012, and this was true in the last decade as well, the one before 2022. 
so you know how can you tell us a little more about this and whether there has been a change in this over the years so so i think let's just put some numbers around this it will help context chill is just how much wealth the indian stock market has created and how few companies have driven that enormous wealth creation So if you look at the 10 years ending March 2012 so the 10 years ending 2012 the indian stock market created the nifty that is the nifty created 23 trillion rupees of 23 trillion rupees of wealth uh, so in dollar terms say 300 billion dollars right 23 trillion rupees yeah roughly 300 billion dollars of wealth was created in the 10 years ending 2012 Um, 17 companies, just one seventh. 17 companies drove 80 percent of that wealth creation, right? Wow. So incredibly concentrated wealth creation yes. in the in that 10 years ending 2012, right? Then if you take the the 10 years ending 2022, right? Uh, the 10 years ending 2022, the Indian stock market created a staggering 105 trillion rupees of wealth, right? So 1.1.4 uh, trillion dollars, right? So 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 basically half of the stock market. half of the stock market's current capitalization was effectively born in the last 10 years right in the last 10 right uh, right so phenomenal jump so from uh, from creating a uh, uh, point uh, 3 trillion we have jumped to 1.4 trillion basically the stock market has created 4x as much wealth 4x as much wealth in the most recent decade than in the first 10 years of the century right so big jump in wealth yeah. creation but but again once again we find that the mere 20 companies mere 20 companies Have accounted for eighty percent of the staggering wealth creation. Right? So from seventeen has just gone to only twenty. Twenty, right? So so the economy has grown far bigger. The stock market has uh, grown far bigger. Uh, stock market's wealth creation has uh, quadrupled. Stock market wealth creation has quadrupled. Mm-hmm. But the number of winners, the number of elite winners, right? Uh, the number of elite winners stays basically a dozen and a half, right? And this polarization. this polarization is basically in a way a byproduct of a networked increasingly digital increasingly high tech economy so a lot of people see india as a poor country but increasingly our economy and, and increasingly the, the the kind of elite the elite constituents of the stock market are companies which are very high tech very sophisticated and they are pulling the country's profits and the country's wealth creation towards them at a rapid rate so the uh, you mentioned profits so this is happening with uh, profits as well where is being concentrated now more than before in fact uh, shall the concentration in profits is even sharper still right so 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 nandita and my colleagues have done uh, enormous amount of work on this in the last 3 to 4 years showing how corporate profitability in india the term we use is polarized showing how corporate profitability in india is getting polarized So, so say had we had this chat a decade ago, Sharad. Decade ago, the top twenty companies in India were accounting for around forty percent of corporate 40%. profits. Forty percent. Okay. Right. So, decade ago is forty. Today, it's close to eighty percent. Eighty percent of the profits in the country are being taken home by twenty companies. So, forty wow. percent ka eighty ho gaya. The elite companies' profit share, elite companies' profit share has doubled in a decade. And just to give you a sense of how remarkable this polarization has been. So, if you take If you take, say, the 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 the, the sort of the biggest profit drivers in the country, say something, a company like HDFC Bank, HDFC Bank alone is around four percent of corporate profits. When HDFC Bank and HDFC merge, yeah, uh, the best best part of seven eight percent, eight percent of national profits will come from one one company, right? Obviously, HDFC Bank is a very successful high tech, increasingly high tech bank. and the entire structure of the indian economy is such that digitization improvement in communication the networking of the country the joining up of the country the advent of gst is mm. allowing these hyper efficient very well run private sector companies to basically pull away 80% of the nation's profits up from 40% a decade ago i was actually going to come to that like what what is driving this polarization if you grew, if you could go into a little more detail i mean how is gst doing this how are the roads doing this how are digital transactions doing this sure so i'll i'll, I'll highlight a couple of facets of this and then nandita if you can bring in the capitalism without capital please which is which is i think a very interesting aspect of this so let me highlight a couple of facets right typically what what economic research has shown the world over economic research Uh, has shown uh, the world over is that when you take uh, an economy which was uh, uh, a regional economy a state level economy and then you knock it together you knock it together by say doubling the road network in the last 10 years which is what we have done uh, trebling the number of bank accounts which is what india has done 
raising the amount of mobile connectivity 50 fold which is what india has done uh, by creating gst and unified national uh, indirect tax system which is what we've done mm-hmm. when you uh, when you join up what was hitherto a regional economy uh, a state wise economy when you join it up um, on that on that consolidated national economic canvas uh, the strongest companies thrive and local right. and regional players fall by the wayside right so that's the at the sort of simplest level that's what's happening and something similar happened in america between 1880 and 1930 america went through the corresponding phase of mm-hmm. network consolidation and those 40 years, 50 years was the creation of the the modern industrial economy that we know america to be but right. beyond this there's a couple of other specific effects which have kicked in in our lifetime which are specific to our era and these these effects are specific to era, our era these effects didn't kick in in america when america was getting industrialized they didn't even kick in for japan when japan was being industrialized right so the first is 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 the rise of um, uh, uh, intangible assets uh, such as r and d brand building uh, right. uh, uh, tra- training uh, 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 and a man called john sutton at the london school of economics interestingly he, he taught me at the lse john sutton wrote a wrote a book called uh, uh, sunk costs and and market structure this was a celebrated book in the early 90s i remember mm-hmm. this was one of my uh, microeconomics textbooks when i was at the lse and john explained in that book why uh, 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 companies that invest in intangibles will go on to rule the world right while they will rule their sectors so in sectors like media technology uh, 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 consumer uh, investment in r and d brand uh, 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 and technology became central john also said that in sectors like steel and cement these intangible investments will be far less will be far less important and therefore sectors like steel and cement he said will consolidate less than sectors like technology like media entertainment and consumer goods right so that's what john sutton 91 this was followed in 96 by uh, by a paper from a man called brian arthur he was at harvard then and this i think is one of the defining papers of of our of our uh, of our era the paper is called increasing returns and the new world of business anybody who's watching this show i would strongly recommend just go into google put brian arthur a r t h u r in the google search engine and put increasing returns uh, and the new world of business and read this 96 paper the uh, the paper is a, is a is a breakthrough paper because in that Brian Arthur said that the companies that will succeed in the next thirty years mm-hmm. are companies that will that will focus on on building products which basically you have to invest once in building the product. Once you've done the first product, the marginal cost of subsequent iterations of the product will be close to zero. Right. Most hence, of the work is done. And after that, you just keep getting returns. Right. Right. So the technical world is increasing returns to scale. And that's why the paper is called increasing returns. The, the, the archetypical example, which still holds true is Microsoft Windows. Right. Of once course. you've, once you've created the first Windows software, uske baad the incremental cost is actually zero. Uh, now remember, uh, uh, when I was, uh, when I was Nandita's age, we used to have software used to come in dabbas. So there was at least some cost of providing the dabba. Huh. Uh, now in the era of cloud, that is also gone. Now so, you're just paying for the internet and you're anyway absolutely. paying for internet. So absolutely. And we are paying for the internet. Microsoft Office has got a money machine. So yes. Satya Nadella is sitting in Seattle and he's got a money machine called Windows where they invest once in writing the code. And after that, it's a non-stop money machine in economics jargon that's called increasing return. So right. back in 96, uh, Arthur prophesied that companies like this will come to rule the world. And, and thus today, when we see not just a Google, but an HDFC bank uh, uh, thinking through the, the algorithm for uh, giving loans to the Chaiwala outside Marcellus basis UPI data. Once HDFC bank has done the initial bit of thinking and coding, then the, the, the HDFC bank uh, uh, algorithms will drive a relentless money machine, which will lend money to millions of such chota chota vendors basis the algorithm which is pulling data from social media putting data from civil pulling data from upi and making automated lending decisions up to millions of small vendors this is exactly how uh, hdfc banks uh, unsecured personal loans and, uh, and sme loans business is going to grow i suspect the smartest private sector banks are going to make money so what was true for microsoft is now increasingly true for the best run banks and 
NBFCs in our country, right? So this right. was uh, uh, Brian Arthur '96, and this was followed by uh, a remarkable book four years ago called Capitalism Without Capital that took this thesis and moved on another step further. And then, do you want to sort of bring out what that what that book taught the world? Absolutely. So uh, basically, tying what Saurav has said until now about you know sunk costs, what John Sutton said about sunk costs in '91, and then followed by Brian Arthur in '96, sort of uh, just putting these ideas together and culminating into a final idea that uh, Stephen Westlake and Jonathan Haskell uh, introduced in their book called Capital Reserve of Capital in 2017 was that uh, companies are incrementally investing in intangible assets. And intangible assets have four characteristics primary. Uh, the first one is scale. Because they're intangible assets and you don't need to uh, invest personally, I mean, there's no tangible or, you know, uh, there's no restriction on the physicality of that asset. Uh, the scalability of that is just, uh, it's infinite. You can scale it to as much as you want. That's the first characteristic. Second one is sunk cost. So this is what John Sutton was also talking about, that once you've invested that cost, you cannot retrieve it back. Uh, it works somehow like a fixed cost. So the higher your fixed cost, the higher your, uh, you know, uh, the future benefits that you will drive because incrementally you don't have to add any substantial cost. And to it that. just keeps generating returns. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Third is spillovers. So oftentimes what happens is uh, whenever you're investing in intangible assets, it's uh, highly likely that someone else will reap the benefits of that intangible asset being developed uh, rather than the person or the company that is actually developing it. So these are the spillover effects. So, you know, there are multiple businesses which use Microsoft uh, Windows uh, and they are generating their business. They're uh, becoming profitable basis, uh, whatever Microsoft has developed. So it has huge spillover effects. It spills over to almost the entire economy, if you were to put it that way. Yeah. For Fourthly, uh, and lastly, it's the synergies that are created by intangible assets. So once you put in some kind of uh, an investment in R&D, for example, and you develop some software or some sort of, you know, some uh, proprietary, uh, uh, you know, software, what it does is basically it will create more business, it will create uh, further, uh, you know, avenues for the company to generate revenue. And these uh, basically play out in a synergistic way. That is, if we were to just, you know, use the software to do some other thing that the software was intended to do, it wouldn't have generated the kind of results that you're, uh, that are resulted uh, after using, uh, you know, in a particular way that maximizes the revenue, that maximizes the benefit. So these are the four characteristics that, you know, are tied to uh, intangible assets. And this is what the book was talking about. And you can clearly see it. So they were talking about the US where it happened at the turn of the century uh, in 2000s. And it's happening in India also, where we can see that, you know, maximum uh, polarization of profits. So this all ties together to the same point that the polarization of profits is happening because these intangible assets are being developed. They are being utilized to the fullest extent by the industry leaders. And that's what makes them uh, the most profitable in their businesses. Right. So, I mean, you've uh, both of you have mentioned Microsoft uh, a few times, and we all know what kind of foundation they built for the world to use. Uh, a similar thing could it be happening right now with things like the metaverse, where they're creating a platform that eventually all of us will be able to use in ways that we can't imagine right now. And so are they themselves creating a kind of an asset that has these kind of spillover effects in the future? So, so I'm sure that's exactly what Mark Zuckerberg and team are trying to do. If they can get the, if they can get their coding and the, the construct right, their hope right. is that if they, if they get the metaverse coding and the construct right, uh, once Sharad decides that, hey, I'm going to do the quartermaster interview on metaverse, then right. per, per force people like Nandita and I will join you in the metaverse to do the interview and, and the purpose, viewers will. yeah absolutely you got it right so that's i think what they are uh, uh, gunning for the 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 reason it's a challenge is and if you can see why the, you can see why the country's profits are getting polarized that the cost the upfront sunk cost right yeah. uh, the upfront sunk cost of building the metaverse the upfront sunk cost of writing that algo which will do uh, chai wale ka uh, unsecured loan basis social media ka data, basis civil ka data, the right. upfront sunk costs in this capitalism without capital world, the upfront sunk cost is heavy. So probably mm -hmm. beyond Meta, I don't think two, three more companies 
probably are the only people who can afford the massive coding required yeah. uh, to to pull it off probably google can maybe someone else and therefore it will be only two to three companies who will actually be able to come up with the meta product right. and out of those three maybe one ma- maximum two will then loop us in and you can see there'll be network effects whoever whoever has the better product or whoever has the whoever is able to build the network quicker much like facebook ka network yeah. if sharad is on meta then uh, sharad benefits from saurabh being on meta if saurabh is okay. on meta nandita saurabh and nandita uh, saurabh and sharad are on meta nandita will say boss maybe meta ke meta meta mein aa jati hu correct right and and so on so forth right and, and that's the network effects that facebook itself was built on hmm. uh, will kick in right so so it's this loop that you got to do upfront kharcha upfront heavy spend on writing the code getting the technology perfect if you do the technology really really well and you get to the market and you have a good pitch you sign up enough people then the network effects kick in um and and because you've done the sunk cost all the kharcha is done upfront yeah. you don't mind doing a little bit of marketing to get the network effect going and once your network effect is going it becomes harder and harder for the alternative guy with a with a metaverse product to catch up with you and similarly say if you look at the if our country if you look at our country in the last decade uh uh if you look at the biggest wealth creators in the last decade right right up there you will find tcs um yes. hdfc bank infosys bajaj finance right these are all fundamentally companies which have used technology very very cleverly hmm. to steal a march on their competitors and thus build a, a virtuous cycle a virtuous cycle of technology of uh, 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 creating profits getting reinvested into more technology then creating spillover benefits for the rest of the businesses and there we therefore we end up standing in a country which superficially looks poor but actually is dominated increasingly by increasingly powerful well capitalized companies investing heavily in technology one caveat on all these companies sir um uh, uh i personally my family nandita's family uh, our colleagues's families and our 10000 clients were invested in marcellus's uh, pms products and mm-hmm. marcellus's pms products contain all of these stocks so just so that people are, people are clear in their heads uh, right. uh, you know we hold, hold the best part of 2 billion dollars worth of these stocks that we are referencing Okay, so ha, so he is not saying please go and buy stocks in these companies. This is not investment advice. So <laughs> please don't get uh, carried away with this analysis. But now my question also then comes: uh, what you were saying also leads me to think that regulation at some point is going to step in because what you are talking about are entry barriers. You know, once a uh, company a, a big company invests in creating this kind of intangible asset and then starts getting returns from it and it's tougher for new people to come in that's in a sense an entry barrier so at right. what point does say the competition commission of india step in and be like hey you guys are too big right. so so i think uh, uh, so let's take the, the the sector where the regulator i think is the most vigilant uh, on this subject the sector being a uh, banking right so yeah. the rbi is obviously very aware of this uh, the fact that Uh, uh if you have privileged data you can build algos around it sign up more customers the more customers you have the more data you have the, the better your algos the greater your profits etc so so courtesy inputs from nandan nilekani uh, 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 rbi has created this account aggregation framework uh, right. i think it went live 2 years ago yes. and it basically says that uh, it basically is a way to democratize the data so so uh, i am a hdfc bank customer um if even if i go to icici bank i can and apply for a loan i can ask hdfc bank to share all my current account uh, and st- uh, savings account data with icici bank so mm-hmm. that using my hdfc bank ka statements icici bank can make a decision on me right? right and 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 that's that's a right that i as a customer have right so so the account aggregator framework can reduce some of the uh Uh, can reduce some of the virtuous cycles that the dominant banks get uh, with the with the capitalism without capital construct however however with the smartest banks and the smartest nbfcs what a bajaj a kotak uh, uh, an hdfc bank are doing is they're saying we will not just uh, credit assess sharad basis his bank accounts statement from state bank of india we will also scrape everything on sharad from social media 
right? Yeah. Uh, if possible, we will also get inside his mobile phone and see what all is inside his mobile phone. That's relatively easy to do in our country. And this is all our, uh, uh, and this will all be done by algos and robots, right? The, uh, we will pull out all the all the tons of data on Sharad from social media, from his phone, and that, and we will credit score Sharad like that. Now that's this sort of terrifying. Uh, I got to tell you. <laughs> yeah, that that sort of uh, 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 that sort of uh, spend. Uh, intensive spend on hiring hundreds of uh, uh, computer scientists and electrical engineers from the best engineering colleges in the country, spending uh, hundreds of crores on writing these algos. There's only a handful of banks and NBFCs which can do that. And, yeah. and, that, and there, it's difficult for the regulator to say, Ki boss, ab mat karo, because this is the free market. And if I'm Bajaj right. Finance and I have the wherewithal to spend heavily on tech and hire the best computer scientists and electrical engineers, well, I will do that. And if that means that the smaller NBFCs get crushed, well, such is life. That's how capitalism works. Yeah. So uh, now there were in, in, in your research note, there were these three case studies that you talked about. Now, you've spoken in some detail about how HDFC has been using technology in a very smart way. And to some extent, you also spoke about TCS and how they've been the second largest wealth creator. But there's a third which has... I guess been a larger part of our lives since the pandemic, but Lal Path Labs, yeah. uh, and they have been doing uh, quite a lot of innovative stuff. So, uh, could you tell us about them? What they've been sure. doing? So, I think you're right. So, HDFC Bank and TCS, in a way, are slightly more obvious plays on a digitized, uh, increasingly tech savvy India. Doctor Lal Path Labs is a slightly less obvious play, right. but uh, the more we've sort of understood Doctor Lal Path Labs model, the more we have realized that what uh, the CEO Om Manchanda has built effectively is a is a uh, is effectively a retailing business with a heavy technology backend, right? So, so let me just sort of put it in another way. Um, a decade ago, a decade ago, uh, 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 the first time when I met Om actually, roughly ten years ago, Dr. Lal Path Lab had barely uh, 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 eight hundred collection centers, primarily in North India, with the hub being Delhi. Right. Today, they have 5,000 collection centers. Right, uh, That's twice as many as any other path lab in the country. Right. And these collection centers are built in a hub and spoke uh, construct. Right, So there's a hub in Kolkata, it spokes around the suburbs of Kolkata. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a hub in Bombay, there's obviously a hub in Delhi, and spokes surrounding uh, uh, these big, big, uh, uh, big hubs. The, the hub is the big reference lab, and the spokes are thousands of collection centers. Right, right. This hub and spoke construct which is joined up by a technology network, uh, largely there's a big SAP platform that they implemented, I think 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. That SAP platform acts as the coordination system between what the various collection centers need, what the center needs to give by way of pipettes and you know uh, beakers and uh, you know the, the the swaps required for for uh, testing, right? So uh, because Dr. Lal is doing five, is offering five thousand tests. They typically need to carry 10 to 15,000 items in the collection center, right? The right. whole coordination of the inventory, the sending of the phlebotomist to Sharad's residence to collect the sample, this, the, the delivery of the sample to the, the, the reference lab, the testing, the email of, emailing of results or uh, uh, the sharing of results with Sharad via his app. That whole technology apparatus is basically the heavy upfront tech investment that these guys made. Uh, that because that tech investment is substantial, it's difficult for, say, let's take an example, a Farmeezy or a Tata 1MG to quite replicate that at this scale, yeah. at, at, at this degree of at this degree of fluidity. Furthermore, the more data Manchanda and Dr. Lab have on Saurabh and his family mm -hmm. and his background or whatever illnesses Saurabh's had, his past results, the harder it becomes for Saurabh to migrate from Dr. Lal to say a yeah. rival chain, right? So, so you've got uh, uh, using the capitalism without capital construct, you've got sunk costs, you've got network effects, and you've got synergies between Dr. Lal doing one bunch of things right, mm -hmm. and that allowing him to pull in a whole new strand of business. So increasingly, in the last four years, what we have seen is uh, these wellness tests, right? They call it Swastha Pit. Huh. Wellness, wellness is becoming increasingly significant offering for them. I suspect around 20, at least 20, 25% of, of, of profits now come from wellness. Wellness is not a blood test or a urine test or a uh, COVID test. Wellness is increasingly about things like a complete health checkup for sort of um, uh, cancer tests, uh, vitamin deficiency tests, genomics tests. Right? So it's just data so, collection. 
So the fact that they they knew my basic health parameters gave them a route into my life. Mm-hmm. Using that, they pulled me into an app. The app then pulled me into uh, a whole world of high value premium tests. Tests so premium that even the largest hospitals in Delhi, Bombay, won't offer. But Dr. Lal will offer, right? And right. and and you can now see why this virtuous cycle uh, becomes very powerful, provided Dr. Lal and Om Manchanda keep taking the the heavy surplus cash flows that they generate. The return on capital is thirty five percent. That means they generate heavy heavy free cash flow. If they keep taking that money, keep launching new tests, new products, upgrading their technology, uh, uh, it's it, it becomes harder and harder for the mom and pop pet lab in say Ghat Koper in Bombay or Sarojini Nagar in Delhi to compete with a Leviathan operating across five thousand collection centers in the country. Right and. Uh... now i know that uh, your time is very very valuable so let's conclude on that note and uh, so that's what we have we have things like upi uh, which is kind of making generating income at the lower end of the pyramid an easier process while at the same time we have wealth and profits also concentrating at the top and it will increasingly get concentrated because it's the people at the top who can afford to spend in generating more profits that's what we have here and this was your episode of quarter master thank you saurabh thank you nandita for joining us and see you on the next episode thank you thank you sir thank you for hosting us thank you